scripture this morning. We read Job chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going to read through that again, just quickly. From the, from the, what I say? From the King, from the King James Version. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? <laughs> that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And again, escheweth evil. If you escheweth evil, then you shun evil. You put aside evil. You have nothing to do with evil. You turn away from evil. See, because that's what the other that's what the other version said. I'm going to read this from the, the New International Version. It says, and shuns evil. The New Living Translation says, and he has, and will have nothing to do with evil. And, and in the American, New American Standard, it says, and turn away from evil, fearing God and turning away from evil. So Job was an upright man. And he was not a one, a one, he was not one in his heart who would Pursue evil things. That's not to say he was not perfect. No, because he, he had his moments. He had obviously had his moments. He was not because he offered the sacrifices. He offered the sacrifices. He did that. But his heart and his mind were tilted towards pursuit of God. We're in thanking God. And we know that it's true in his heart because Job was a prosperous man already. He already had. Let's see if I can find that real quick. Uh, he had about 7,000 sheep, 3,000 cattle, or something like that. Uh, but he had a lot already. Man, I had that mark. Never mind. But it, it says in there that Job had a lot. See, now that's just going to stick with me. Here it is, verse 3. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 yoke of oxen, 500 male donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. Job had it going on. But everything that Job had, Job was still thankful to God. Job was still a man in pursuit. He got God's attention. He got God's attention because God was able to say in the presence of the devil himself, have you considered my servant Job? God knew what he was asking. God, There's nothing God doesn't know. God knows that the devil was down there trying to get in, get at Job. But God's hands of protection was around him. Why was God's hands of protection around him? Not because Job was so rich, but because Job thanked God. Job was thankful unto God for everything that he had. He was thankful unto God, but Job's possessions didn't possess Job. What Job had didn't have him. God had Job. God had Job's heart. So when the devil comes in, and he's, he's, you know, where you been? Oh, you know, sitting, going to and forth throughout the land, seeking who might make it out, who might... You know, can cook up, you know, do what, whatever. And it's kind of a dig. Well, have you considered my servant Job? So God allowed Job to go through all of those things. See? The title of today's message is actually The Deliverance of Job and His Friends. Because many times in the past when I've thought about the account of Job, I often, I, I just, uh, myself, have narrowed it down to Job. God had something that he wanted to give to Job. God wanted to prosper Job. God wanted to, he, he wanted to show to others, he wanted to demonstrate also his power of provision, his power of, of protection, his power of, of being able to restore. He wanted to demonstrate all that. But, you see, always when I, when I always thought about Job, I, 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 <laughs> I would always narrow it down to just Job. But as I, I was reading through this again recently, and I got to Job chapter 42. Let's go to chapter 42. I 
I got a slightly different perspective on Job and his and his going going through. And it started in verse seven, and it's it's the the, the subtitle of this is of this section in this particular Bible, and it. It's titled, The Deliverance of Job and His Friends. It just, it, it, it put a twist on. It, it, it opened, it broadened, broadened my perspective on what exactly it was that God was doing in this situation. See, as a quick recap for all of this. As a quick recap, we have, I'm just going hi to highlight the, the high points here. We have Job. There's the first assault of Satan upon Job where all the cattle, the, the Chaldeans, they came, took all the cattle, took everything from him. His, his possessions-wise, it was all taken. And Job sinned not with his mouth. He, he had no charge against God. Then the second attack. See, chapter 1, verse 20. Then Job arose. This is after the after the after all the reports of everything that had been gone and that had been gone wrong. The Chaldeans came, killed the servants, killed all the servants, uh, took all his donkeys, the oxen that were plowing, they took everything. Job chapter 1 verse 20 then Job arose and he tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped Job got bad news and he worshipped see God knew that's why he allowed that to go on see because that's a that's a thumb in the devil's eye that's a black eye to the devil the devil says well you know what if I'm going to put my hands on him if I'm going to take away everything that he has he will surely turn against you. He will surely put his mouth on you. He will surely speak against you. Job chapter 1, verse 20, Job fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall, shall I return there. Then he goes on to say, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He just lost Everything that made him the man in the land. He was the, he was the richest person in the land. It says that. So that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. That's chapter 1, verse 3. He was the greatest man. But in the face of all of that, verse 22 says, In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Mm. Wow. That's powerful. So now becomes this second attack against Job. Okay? He comes again. Verse 7, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Everything was taken away. His, his children have been taken away. All his cattle have been taken away. Everything that he had. Again, everything that made him great. The greatest in the land has been taken away. Children, so he's grieving, he's lost it all, but he's worshiping. Worship God. Second attack comes, and the second attack is against his person now. Boils. Okay, there it was, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown, top, head to toe. He's covered with painful boils. Verse 8, and he took um, for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. So the boils were, were so bad upon himself, he was trying to scrape them with a basically a... a, a a broken pot, a piece of a broken pot, and he's scraping them. These boils, trying to get rid of them, trying to relieve the, the, the pain of the boils. Verse 9. 
Then his wife said unto him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Mm. Curse God and die. Verse 10, but he said to her, Ah, oh, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? Here's the verse, here's the phrase. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. He just lost everything. And, and when you lose everything, and in and, and the end you can say, well, at least I still got mad. Job couldn't even say that now. And in his, in, 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 in his having lost everything, and, 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 and he was worshiping God in the midst of all that loss. He was worshiping God. Gets, that gets struck, struck down himself, now physically struck down. And in, in the throes of that, now realizing, and now he's, he's struck down and he's old, and he's trying to administer to himself with a broken pot, just scraping his, the boils that have covered him from, from head to toe. Then the closest one to him comes to him and says, uh, do you still hold fast to your integrity? In the face of everything that we've lost, in the face of everything that has gone wrong, will you still hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. The very thing that the enemy was trying to get Job to do comes out of the mouth of the one closest to him. But God knew that Job would stand. God knew that Job would stand. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So here, the enemy's taking away everything Job was. He's using what he's using the closest one to Job to attack him. Okay? That failed. So now what does he do? Chapter 2, verse 11, the arrival of Job's friends. <laughs> friends, okay? Not, not, not Ross and Phoebe and, and, and Monica. And that. No, 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 no. They didn't show up. They might have had something to help with. Help, help out. It might have been funny, clumsy or whatever, but they might have been able to help. But see, Job's friends show up with their intentions, Okay? You got Eliphaz, Zophar, Bildad. These are Job's three friends who show up. Job has lost his children. He had seven sons and three daughters. He's lost his children. He had all the cattle, all the sheep, all the donkeys, all the land. Everything is gone. And his friends show up. And the first thing his friends want to do is blame Job for what he's going through. Eliphaz, chapter 4. Eliphaz believes the innocent do not suffer. See, his friend believes that the innocent aren't supposed to suffer. That's right there in the Word. That's chapter 4. See, later on, Eliphaz, he calls Job foolish. See, then later on, he, later still, he encourages Job to appeal to God. Okay, he should have done that in the first place without the judgment. He should have done that in the first place without the, the, the condemnation. The innocent don't suffer. Have you heard that before in the kingdom? Have you heard that before from somebody close to you when you're going through? The innocent don't suffer. Had to have done something. Had to have done something. Look, look at you. You know, you know, now look at you. See? Eliphaz, he encourages Job not to despise God's discipline. Job replies with his deep anguish. He seeks his friend's sympathy. He does question God's continuing trials. 
Then Bildad, the other friend, he steps in. He argues with Job. Job argues his case back. And he questions his oppression. Then comes Zophar. Zophar jumps in. <laughs> Job responds that only God knows. Job, he begs God to speak to him. He mourns his situation. That was the, in the, in, in the outline here, it's called the first cycle of debate. Okay? <laughs> So when you think the first cycle of debate ends, Job, it ends as Job, he's mourning that man only has one wife. He's lost all of this, okay? His wife doesn't even have his back. Now his friends come, and they're telling him what he's done wrong, why he's going through and everything. And he's crying out to the Lord. He's mourning that he only has one life. He's crying out to the Lord. Here they come again, Eliphaz. Now we're up to chapter 15. Eliphaz tells Job, verses 1 through 13, he says, Job, your mouth condemns you. Wow. <laughs> then he tells Job, the wicked suffer. Eliphaz, the same one that says, innocent people do not suffer. And he called Job foolish earlier. See, now he's telling Job, your mouth, his mouth condemned him. Now he's telling Job that the wicked suffer. See? Job responds to Eliaz. Eliphaz, thank you. <laughs> then Job's response to his, his, to his friends, he tells them, you know what, y'all are some miserable comforters. Job chapter 16. He, he, he calls his friends miserable comforters. Then he laments his, his situation some more. He defends his innocence. Where it says God makes Job a byword. Then Elihu answers Job's complaints. Elihu, he, he gives a rebuttal. He gives his conclusion. Elihu believes that God is disciplining Job. And Elihu reminds God, Job, of the greatness of God. Job doesn't need to be reminded of the greatness of God. Job remembered God in his prosperity. Job remembered God in his prosperity. So you got Elihu now. Now he's coming in telling him that God must be disciplining you for some reason. And he reminds of, of, of the greatness of God. Yeah, okay, fine. Thank you, thank you. Now we get to chapter that what is called part three. See, we've had three rounds now, two rounds of, of the debate that's going back and forth about why Job is sick and, 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 and all this other you know, madness from his friends where his friends aren't offering the what, what Job needs as comfort. Three cycles of debate. Job has a final defense of himself. He comes to the point in verse chapter 31 where he pleads to meet God and defend himself. <laughs> Again, he's lost everything. His own wife, you know, isn't there to comfort him, okay? Now his friends come, and they're arguing with him. They're telling him what he's done wrong. They're telling him, you know, God is punishing you for this. The wicked don't suffer, or the, the innocent don't suffer. Only the wicked suffer. You, you've done something wrong. And then God, then Job says, before himself. That's where Eli, Elihu comes in with his arguments. And everything. And then Job has actually two controversies with God himself. And God answers Job. God brings Job. He brings it back. Even in bringing up controversy with God, Job still never sinned. He still never sinned. That which the enemy was trying to get him to do, to turn against God, to speak against God, to rail against God, to believe, to, to, to doubt to fear, Job never did any of that. Never did any of that. Never, ever, ever. Not in the face of his own wife, not in the face of his friends, his friends. And you know, these had to be three close friends because they came. They heard that Job was, you know, sick. They heard that something had gone wrong in the Job household. Let's go see Job. Let's go see Job. And their intentions 
their intentions, I'm sure to them, they thought they were doing good. Job's going through this. Oh, let's go help Job. Let's go correct Job. Let's get Job off that bed of, bed of sickness that he's on. Their intentions were not to bring Job down. Their intentions were to get Job back right with God, you see. But in their demonstration and through their arguments with Job, through their attempting to convince Job, all they proved with their attitude about God was wrong that their attitude about God was wrong. Their perception of who God was was wrong. Their knowledge of God was wrong. Mm -hmm. How they looked at God, how they thought about God. <clears throat> See, they had to have read the word. They had to have been taught somewhere along the way. They had to have heard the accounts, the stories, because here they come in with full confidence that they know who God is. But the, and the three of them, four of them, Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz, and Elihu, four friends came in. And all of these have a wrong perception of who God is. They're the majority in this little scenario right here. Numerically against Job, they are the majority. And they're all coming in with these wrong attitudes. The majority of Job's friends come in. You're wrong. You've done something wrong. The wicked suffer. The innocent don't suffer. Your mouth has condemned you. All these arguments, all these arguments, God is disciplining you. You did something wrong. That's why you're going through this. You see? So his wife. His own friends are coming in and they're doing their best to convince him that he has done wrong because they don't know who God is. Because they don't know God like that. But see, in all of Job's thanking God and all of Job's praising God and all with the enemy, Job was the upright one. Job was the upright one. Job was the one praising constantly. But the ones, the, the friends who are out here who have a distorted idea of who God is who's on the who's on the sick bed Job who's on the sick bed Job see if God allows these any of these to go through that persecution what's going to happen the devil's going to be right the devil's going to be right because if any of these who haven't gone through who haven't been thankful to God, who haven't had Job's attitude towards God. Because Job can lose everything, and he can tear his clothes and say, you know what, naked I came from the womb, naked shall I return. Shall we accept only good from God and not accept adversity? Shall we not accept adversity? Because we know God's going to get us through it. Yeah. Those are Job's words. After having lost children, servants, animal, everything, what, everything that made him rich, everything that gave him the lifestyle that he was able to enjoy. Job lost all of that and was able to worship God, went right into worship. Not depression, not despondency, not solitude. He got into the presence of the Lord upon hearing the news, worshiped God. Worshiping God is being thankful to him for who he is. We sang because of who you are. Well, I just butchered that. But we sang because of who you are, I give you glory. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If that song had existed back then, Job would have been singing it. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Nisi. Ooh. Mm. Mm. He would have sang all of that. Jehovah Shalom, my prince of peace. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Job would have been singing that song. But if Zophar, Eliphaz, Elihu, if Bildad, had any of them gone through any of that, they would have surely turned on God. They would have surely complained against God. They would have surely sinned against God. Job knew God. See, 
So their attitude, they needed an attitude adjustment. They needed to see the real God. But how are they going to see the real God? Hmm. Through Job. Through Job and his situation. Through Job and his circumstance. So here they come with their high ideas. Here they come with their, I know God. I've got God figured out. You know those people. See, God, Eliphaz comes in. Oh, the innocent don't suffer. Job, you're foolish. You need to get before God. Job has been before God. You see, Job has been before God. And dig this. And check this out. Remember what you shared earlier. Job went before God because he wanted to be before God. Not because he needed to be before God. Job was rich. Job was rich. Job lacked nothing. But Job was thankful. Job made all those sacrifices to God because he wanted to be in God's presence. He wasn't there because he needed to be in God's presence, because he was going through something hard and horrible. Job was in God's presence because he wanted to be in God's presence. Man, look at this right here. See, if this song was back there, Job would have sang it. While I'm down here, Lord, I want you to help me. See? <laughs> While I'm down here singing, I want you to help me. Job would have been singing this song. He was singing this song before it all happened. See? So that way he was singing it before it all happened, before he lost everything. So after he lost everything, when Job had all those riches and everything, it was him and God. It was him and God. So when the riches went away, when the children went away, when the wife wasn't acting right, when the friends come in, it's still Job and God. So he, to Job, he really didn't lose anything. Woo! He really didn't lose anything. <laughs> but see, God said, you know what? In addition to, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm going to get something to Job. I want to get something to Job. He sees these other four over here. And how and what their attitude is towards him. He said, you know what? Not only do I need to get something to Job, I need to fix them. I need to fix them too. I need to fix them too. Oh yeah. Oh, 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 oh. hey. Where you been? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Have you considered my servant Job? God knows what he's doing. Oh. He knows exactly. We talked about that pearl dropping in the water and the waves. You see, Job wasn't a little pearl. Job was a big old stone. Kabloosh. You drop it in the water, it makes that kabloosh, you know, that deep sound. Job kabloosh down in the water. So them ripples were going out strong, see. And they went out so strong, here they are out there. See, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu, all four of them, they're sitting out there and they, they're feeling the water. It's like, oh, something's wrong. Something's wrong with Job. Let's go fix Job. Their attitude is they're going to go fix Job. See, God is drawing them unto him through Job's trial so that he can fix them. He's trying to prosper Job. He's trying to prosper Job. He's trying to elevate Job from where he was. See, physically, monetarily, you know, materially, if you will, socially. He, he's trying to bring Job up. But when he brings Job up, he's not leaving them out. He says, when I, think, when I lift him, I'm going to fix you. He's lifting Job up to fix them. See? <laughs> Woo! Job had to be brought down so that he could be lifted up so that somebody else could get fixed. Woo! Yes. The deliverance of Job and his friends. Let's go to Job 42. Everything that's going on. He loses his children. He loses all his cattle. He loses all his livestock. He loses everything that made him the greatest man in the East. His wife has no words of comfort for him. His friends have no words of comfort for him. He argues with them. He has 
debates, cycles of debate with them. He has his own controversy with God. God sets Job straight here in chapter 42. Chapter 42, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 from the New King James Version. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Hmm. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job confesses his lack of understanding. He says, you know what, God? You're right. I have no clue. I don't understand. He confesses his lack of understanding. See, if Job had his NIV Bible sitting before him, you know, he could have referred to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and he shall direct your path. But he didn't have that there. All he had right there was his heart that told him, you know what? He, before the Lord right there, had to confess his lack of understanding. And he doesn't stop there. Verse 4. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you will answer me. I have heard you, I have heard of you by, hear, by the hearing of, of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Job repents of his rebellion. He admits his lack of knowledge, excuse me, his lack of understanding, and he repents of his rebellion. He repents of his rebellion. And as soon as he comes before the Lord, he admits his lack of understanding, he comes before the Lord and he repents of his rebellion. Verse 7, and so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have spoken not of me what is right as my servant of Job had, as my servant Job has. My he's talking to Eliphaz now. Eliphaz comes in and says the innocent don't suffer. Only the wicked suffer. You need to go before the Lord. Find out what you did wrong. God deal with Eliphaz. He says, my wrath has aroused against you and your two friends. For you have not spoken of me what is right. Be careful how we convey God to others. We don't want his wrath to rise up against us. We know God better than that. We know God better than that. And better, and even, 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 you see, if you don't know God correctly to yourself, you can't correctly convey him to others. Make sure you know who God is, who the God is that you're trying to convey to others. Make sure you know from the word, from the word where he demonstrates himself, from the word where he tells us who he is, not our understanding of who he is, not our perception of who he is, but our knowledge of who he is based on our experience with him. Here we go. Verse 8, now therefore, take yourself seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up yourselves a burnt offering. Offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly. Because you have not spoken of me what is right. That's twice he's let him know now, as my servant Job has. Remember, Eliphaz was the one that called Job foolish. Eliphaz is the one coming and telling Job how God, what God does and what God doesn't do. But he's wrong in his estimation. He's wrong in his understanding. He's wrong in his conveyance of who God is and how God operates. This is twice now God says, you have not spoken of me what is right. So you go take up. 
56, seven bulls and seven rams, and go to Job and offer for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job, the one whom you've been coming against, the one who you, who you condemn, my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him. He's good with me. Mm -hmm. Lest I deal with you according to your folly. Because you have not spoken of me what is right. As my servant Job has. You didn't even flip the script. Telling Eliphaz, Mr. You know, I got this together. I'm, I'm here to help you. Okay. Flip the script on him. As my servant Job has. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Naamathite, went and did as the Lord commanded them. For the Lord had accepted Job. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Job didn't get a chance to gloat. I don't believe it was in Job to gloat. Because Job could have his riches and still praise and thank God in a manner that gets God's attention like that. Then it didn't just wasn't in gloat, gloat. Job to gloat like that. But Job Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers and sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before, they came to him and they ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. They heard about these things. None of them came. None of them came while he was while he was down and out. And I believe God allowed that so that the four friends could be dealt with. So that their hearts could be changed. So that their eyes could be opened unto who God was. But afterwards, afterwards, when it was God's time, when it was God's time, then the comforter, then the consolation, then all the consolers came. And they ate with him and they consoled him after everything that the Lord had brought. But see, they didn't, just, they didn't just come and eat with him. They didn't just come and have kind words. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a ring of gold. Wow. After it was all said and done. And as all his brothers and sisters and his, and his acquaintances, when it was all over, after he lost it and right after it all happened and all of that, none of them showed up. But it's not a knock against them. That's how God allowed it. That's how God allowed it. So that he could do the work that he needed to do. Because had they come, had they come, Zophar, Eliphaz, Elihu, and Bildad wouldn't have had the audience that they did. They wouldn't have had the opportunity that they did with Job one on one. They wouldn't have had that. Because all these other others would have gotten in the way. Yeah. So God, God is intentional. But when they did come, each one gave him a piece of silver and a ring of gold. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. More than, he's a more than God, exceeding abundantly above what we could ask or imagine. The Job and the Lord, now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. For he now had 14,000 sheep, where once he had seven. He had six thousand camels where before he had three. One thousand yoke of oxen where he before he had five hundred. And one thousand male female donkeys where before he had five hundred. He also had seven sons and three daughters. The same number he had before. Not double. <laughs> same number. Okay. And moving on. Verse 15. In all the land were no were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. 
It didn't say that about the first one. Not that there was anything wrong yeah. with him. Okay. No, not that it, there was nothing wrong with him. But the, the, the next three, there was none in the land so beautiful as Job's daughters. Verse 16, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren and four, and four generations. So Job died old and full of days. So Job died old and full of days. He didn't think about being old and full of days as he was going through it. When he got that news, initially when he got the news, the first after the first wave of attack, he tore his clothes and he worshipped God. He tore his clothes and he worshipped God. But see, God knew that that was unfair. That's why he allowed then, after the second attack, when it was closer, when it was more personal, when it was his, his own health. See, we can, we can deal with a lot as long as it's basically, and, and I say the loss of a child, but that's, it's still exterior. It's not your personal, physical self going down. But in the midst of all of that, still having that going on, but still having the mindset and the attitude to worship God, the second step of a wave, the second step of a wave, second wave of the attack was against his physical body. Then the third wave, the third wave of attack, if you will, is now that you're down and out, now that you are in the doldrums of, you know, this attack, then his wife comes. Do you still have your integrity? Do you still believe in this Satan God? Do you still, why don't you just curse him and die? Because it can't get worse. She didn't know she was making it unbeknownst to her, or maybe she didn't know, but don't know, don't know, you know, she was still there, but she didn't leave, because he had 10 more children after that, she had 20 children after that, wow, but in his time, in his most down time, when he's lost everything, when it's all gone, and then the one closest to him attacked him, then, then his friends came, and again, it was an attack against him. It was all about, it was all about Job and his relationship with God. It was all about Job. God knew what Job was going to do. Job had already demonstrated what he could do. He'd already showed. See, the devil, he wasn't smart enough to know. See, when, when I was in the military and we'd have certain uh, like flight chief supervisors come around and in order to get to that flight chief position, you kind of got to know a little bit about every job in that branch. There's five shops. So you got to know a little bit about those, 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 um, those five shops. And we had this one particular senior master sergeant when I was at Covina. He, he knew quite a bit about all the shops. I mean, so he was very, very well studied. So he came down and he was asking questions about um, our oil analysis machine. And the guy that he was asking the questions to was kind of trying to uh, slough off the answer, you know, give him an answer, you know, because well, he doesn't, he, he's not gonna be out, he doesn't know what's going on. But I can see he's not asking this question because he doesn't know, he's asking this question to see what you know, to see how you will answer. And I couldn't say anything, see, because he was testing that guy. And for me to jump in, uh, you know, violation of, of, of protocol, but I could see what was going on. So the guy, the, the, the senior master sergeant, he's like, hmm, okay, all right. So he answers, he leaves. And the guy was feeling pretty good about himself and everything. So I asked him, I says, um, so do you, do you really think that, you know, the answer you gave was a good answer? I was like, yeah, he said, it, it, it was close, you know, it was close. Uh, it wasn't exactly on, but, you know, it, it was close enough to the right answer. I said, so do you, do you think he was in here asking questions because he was trying to learn about the job, or do you think he was trying to see how much you know? And the guy kind of froze in his in his steps. You know, he wasn't so smug or you know content about his answers. Then he said, "Generally, when they come around like that, he said you don't get to that position without knowing a certain amount. So if he knows enough to come in and ask that question about the machine, he's not here trying to learn. He's here trying to teach you." 
he put it into his head. He was asking questions about it to see what he would know. And now he knows what that guy knows. See, But when God allows us to go through those tests, it's because he already knows. But he's trying to get us to a point. And it's not a, a you know, a check off box kind of point, but he's trying to get us to a point. He's just trying to get us to a point. He knew what Job was going to do. He knew what Job's answer was. Even when Job had controversy with God, God straightened Job out. He straightened him out. You know, oh, yeah, where, where were you when I was creating things? Really? You're going to question me on that? Where were you when I was creating things? Uh-huh. Really? Can I, can I compare you to the behemoth? Can I compare you to the, to the Leviathan? So what, what do you know? Okay. And Job stepped back. See, but Job confessed his lack of understanding. He confessed his lack of understanding. And he admit and he and he and he and he repented of, of his rebellion. Because it was it was rebellion when he put himself in that position to question God the way he did. He didn't sin against God. But when he questioned God the way he did, that was where Job hit, that's where he had to be put back in line. But the beauty of this is that. And like we said before, God saw Job, but he also saw Job's four friends. He saw Job's righteousness. He saw Job's uprightness. He said, I'm going to reward this. Remember how Romans 12, Romans 8 and 28, for God works all things for good, for good, for kingdom good. So God works all things for good. Job was brought down so that he could be lifted up. But in Job being lifted up, his connection to his friends, as he was, imagine Job, okay, in the middle. And his four friends are around him. And their connection is the friendship, right? Okay. They all, they all know each other. They all believe in God, right? Job's in here righteous. Job is straight. These four, these four, have a wrong opinion, wrong idea, wrong concept of who God is. So when Job was brought down, when Job goes down, see, they're all on the same plane. When Job goes down, they're all connected together by a string, right? When Job goes down, that drew them all in. Closer. Because Job went down, but God was already in it. And when he got closer, they got closer to God. See, then Job, when God brought Job back up and then elevated him, see, he did what he was going to do. He, 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 he got Job and he says, okay, now I'm going to elevate you. And when he lifted Job up even higher, that pulled the strings even tighter so they drew in closer. So they got to experience now who God really is. Who God really is. See? So God, he's allowing us to go through the things that he goes through, not just for our own good. Because we won't even know. We, won't, we, we, we may not even know. We may never know. But we know that even as we're going through at our hardest time, at our lowest point, the, the attacks, all Job's attacks, the, the, in the first wave, it was all exterior people who didn't even know Job, the Chaldeans. They knew of Job. They knew of Job. They knew you can't be the richest man in the land and not have other people in other lands know about it. So they came and they took all of that away. They, they had no idea who Job was. They didn't know Job's family. They didn't know his last name. They didn't know his lineage. They, didn't, they might have not, not known any of that. They knew what he had. And that's what they came for. And they took all of that. Job's second wave of attacks were internal attacks from his inner circle. Second the, the second wave of attack was against his person, his physical person. The, after, the, after the physical person was attacked, then his mental person was attacked by his wife, by his friends. But God had him that whole time. God had him that whole time. Brought him down to draw them closer. And then God elevated him up, drew them even closer to God. So they can experience God for who he is. See, God does everything with intent and purpose. He does everything with intent and purpose. So know that through all of that, Job did not sin. Through all of that, Job did not speak against God the way that the enemy was certain he was going to. Again, had any of his four friends gone through that very same thing, they would have. They're flailing. He used Job and Job's situation to help fix them. Job prayed for them. He did, 
Job didn't get a chance to, to get well, you know, and get, then start getting consoled, and then start thinking, man, you are the ones who love me. Y'all, y'all, y'all are the ones who love me. Not, not these four. They're, you know, I'm not talking to them anymore, or I'm going to cut, you know. No, God didn't allow that. He didn't, get, he didn't give Job time for any of that. Before he could even be delivered, God sent them to Job so that he could pray for them. They had to do their sacrifices. Like God said, seven bulls, seven rams. You will, y'all will go do the sacrifice, but Job will pray for you. Because I can deal with Job. I can't deal with y'all right now. I'm not ready for y'all right now. Somebody else's deliverance was in Job's deliverance. Somebody else's deliverance was in Job's deliverance. For Job's deliverance. So God knows what he's doing. He knows why, he knows how, and he knows who he's using. We, we might not know. We might not know. We, we might have an idea, but we don't know who God is using through all this. Through all this. We, we, we don't know. But the ones that we know about, we pray for them. And we pray for them. And we, you know, we search ourselves. We search ourselves. And just tell them, We tell God, I, I lack understanding. We're saying, I don't, I don't need to know the why. I don't need to know the why. But see, Job, he didn't have his own account. He didn't have his own life to, to, to look back and read over and say, oh, that's what God's doing. Oh, okay. He didn't have that. All he had was his knowledge of God, who God was. Because if it, it kept him while he was in plenty. See, Job wasn't born rich. He had to have worked up to that point. But in working up to that point and getting to that point, he never forgot God. So that when he lost it all, he never forgot God. So he read God and all that. Double, full of trouble, better than before. Prettier daughters than he had before, you know. Doesn't say anything about the sons, you know. But prettier daughters than what he had before. More beautiful. That's not a, none in the land is beautiful as Job's daughter. He never forgot God. God, God was Job's habit. God was Job's habit. So when you have a habit, Bad or good, it's hard to break that habit. When God becomes our habit, when we humble ourselves before Him, let Him do what it is He's going to do. And when we remember to pray for those who come against us, God can do what it is He needs to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's give Him some praise.